Welcome to Moments with Melinda. And my guest today is Dan Chasen. Hey, Dan, thanks for joining me today on Moments with Melinda. Hey, Melinda, it's great to be here. It's thanks great, for having me. great to have you with me. Well, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. There's a lot about you, so I'm going to try to get through this quickly. Dan Chasen, who was born in Burlington, Vermont, attended Rice High School. He received his BA at Amherst and his PhD from Harvard. Dan is an American poet, critic, and journalist. The Siboney Review called Dan Chasen the country's most visible poet critic. Dan is a longtime contributor to The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, and received the award in literature, American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Guggenheim Fellowship, Pushcart Prize, and the Whiting Award. Dan is the Lorraine C. Wang Professor of English at Wellesley College. He has written six books and is embarking on a biography about Senator Bernie Sanders. Is that all about right? That's about right. Thanks so much. You have one of the most illustrious um, careers. I'm just so excited to have you here. Um, I also wanted to say happy birthday to you because you have a birthday coming up in a few days. So yeah, coming up. Happy birthday. 51. Appalling. Well, you look terrific. Um, so you grew up in Vermont as the only child of a single mother, and you yes. attended Rice Memorial. Now, my son Eli remembers you as a very cool but studious fellow yeah. who did not participate in the foolishness of high school that he does. I tried not to. I tried, not, I did a bit, just a little bit. But not like the crowd he was running with anyway. Um, <laughs> And uh, and he said that you marched to your own drum. Um, he was not surprised by your tremendous success. Uh, and my husband and I directed you in a few musicals at Rice High School. Um, so Dan, tell us a little bit about what we don't know about you. Tell us a little bit about your childhood growing sure. up here in Vermont. That's great to hear. And uh, yeah, I remember Eli really fondly. He was, I believe he was Puck in the production of Midsummer Night's Dream where I had a very small role. I was uh, Robin Starveling, one of the rude mechanicals. Um, but uh, maybe he was a year or two behind me and um, we knew each other well. Um, I, uh, yeah, I grew up in Burlington. I grew up across the street from Campus Kitchen uh, on 258 Colchester Avenue. It's a house that was bought by Trinity College when my grandparents sold it. And now when Trinity went out of business, UVM took it up. So it's a dorm for grad students now. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my father vanished early in my life when I was an infant and my mother moved back in with her parents and I was raised, raised there. Very Catholic uh, family and upbringing. We were very connected to, to Trinity College, which was right next door. Um, both my grandmother and my mother worked at Trinity um, in various capacities. Um, my mom liked to socialize with the nuns uh, at the villa there at Trinity. <laughs> and. Um, so I have nice memories of that sort of neck of the woods. Um, and uh, right, I went to Mater Christi uh, and eventually to Rice. And I credit a lot of my, I don't know if it's success or whatever, my career, my writing life to some excellent teachers that I had at those schools, including both Donahue's, um, John Donahue passed away when I was a sophomore in high school, it was very tragic. Um, and his wife, Christine, who was my eighth grade teacher. And another name I'll mention because people know him is Robert Brown, who was a great, inspiring um, English teacher, AP English. I was introduced to poetry in high school, which I don't think is that common really anymore. I, my students have not had a lot of experience with poetry. So I'm really very grateful for that. So, um can you share with us who your greatest inspiration was in your life and who helped to guide you in your literary career? The, uh, yeah, I would say, um, you know, I, I would say the biggest intervention for me was in Robert Brown's AP English class at Rice Memorial High School. Not only did he introduce me to Wallace Stevens and T.S. Eliot and Elizabeth Bishop and all these great poets that have kept me company ever since. But, you know, I, I was not clued into elite colleges. Um, and he told me that I had to apply to his alma mater, which was Amherst College. And so uh, I did, you know, entirely with his guidance and support. And, um, 
And then when I got there, there were so many influences. There were so many. It was a real eye-opening experience to me. I'd barely been out of Vermont. Um, not that Amherst is, you know, Paris or, you know, Rome, but it, it felt cosmopolitan to me. Is he still alive? He is, yeah. He's still, he's still alive. I hear from him sometimes. Yeah, he's, I think he's doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. he, must, he must love watching your career and reading your books and... Oh, well, I hope so. He taught me a lot. involved in your career. Do you ever see him? Do you ever come up and visit with him? I haven't, but I ought to. Maybe this will be my uh, impetus. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think that would be great. Um, so your work has received a lot of, a lot of attention over the years. Um, and uh, so what do you attribute your success to? And can you talk a little bit about some poets who might have inspired you in your work? Sure. Well, um, I always took the work very seriously and I was always very tough on myself and um, I never uh, wanted to just pass as a good writer. I, I wanted it to be something I felt in my bones was the case. And um, when I was in my, when I was in grad school at Harvard, I was studying to be a poetry scholar. Uh, but I was not a, uh, at that time writing, writing poetry myself. And I looked up a man named Frank Bedart, who was um, and is a good friend of mine who taught at Wellesley College. And it was yet another one of these interventions. You know, it's incredible what a good teacher and mentor can do for a person. So for a long time, I wrote really exclusively for him. I would, I would write a poem and I would wait in a nervous, intense way for him to read it and get back to me. Um, and, uh, it was that kind of intense mentorship, I think that made a real difference, you know, for me, he was a tough reader, tough mentor. Um, I would, I would often have to go back to the drawing board. Um, I think that kind of thing is too rare these days. You know, I sense myself being too soft on my students. We, we, I know it's terrible. Yeah. But tell, but tell, but there's a story about you slipping the poems through the mailbox. Can you share? Oh that yeah, with us? oh yeah, That's yeah, a yeah. Great, Thanks. great story. Yeah, yeah. So Frank's an eccentric guy. He keeps evening hours. He wakes up, um, you know, four in the afternoon or six at e in the evening, and stays up all night. So I would, um, I would drive my poems, and this is before email, right? So I would drive the physical object over to his apartment in Cambridge on Spark Street, and I'd slip it in the mailbox. And I would wait in a nervous, anxious way all day long for the phone call, for the phone to ring, and for him to get back to me, often with disappointing news, I must say, but it's okay. There was trust and a long-term investment. So um, back to the drawing board. Frank had been uh, the protege of the great poet Robert Lowell, um, who was a favorite of mine. And one thing that just wowed me was when I would go over to his apartment to slip my poems in his mailbox, Lowell had stayed with him in the apartment in the 1970s for like two months. And there was Robert Lowell's name on the mailbox. And I really felt I was part of this kind of literary ancestry, so. Well, you are. I, I, I mean, I don't, so. th I don't think that you can avoid that. I think you are part of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So talk, talk, talk to us a little bit about your works, about some of the books that you've written. You've written six. Can yeah. You a little bit about your books, with my guess. Sure. I mean, the, w one thing I would say is there's a lot of Vermont in them and a lot of Burlington in them. And um, as you mentioned, I am writing this, this book about Bernie now. It's specifically about Bernie's rise in Burlington, which feels like a departure for me, except that I've been living mentally in Burlington pretty much since I left. And um, so the first book I wrote is called The Afterlife of Objects. And it is about growing up, uh, you know, in the specific circumstances of my family, living with my grandparents and my mother, and um, reckoning with some tragedies that had befallen my family in the past. Um, it's very autobiographical. I don't know if it feels that way to readers, but it certainly felt that way writing it. Um, so I did that. Um, I wrote a book called Natural History, which is uh, an attempt to get out of my own autobiography and write sort of a more encyclopedic, bring more of the world in, science, knowledge, um, have a bigger, grander view, 
bigger bigger canvas. So that was a highlight. Um, I wrote a book in 2014, a book of poetry called Bicentennial. And the title poem is set uh, in Battery Park in Burlington at the Bicentennial celebration, which I think is my first memory. I was five. Uh, and I remember, um, I've always cultivated as my first memory anyway. I remember getting up on somebody's shoulders and in the band shell or hatch shell there, there was a, there was a group of, I don't know, veterans, guys from various wars playing music. And I remember looking past it over the lake at the Adirondacks. And um, so what I did when I wrote that book was kind of go back into my memory of that um, of that day and build a structure around it. Um, so that was kind of thrilling for me to do. Um, and then the latest book I have is called The Math Campers. I have it right here. Did We're going to talk about that. I have it. Okay, cool. I have it too. Ah, look at I've that. I've read it. I love it. I'm just, um, and this was sort of a tip of the hat to your two teenage sons. Is that correct? It is. It really is. Right. Yeah, because they're 15 and 17. Well, they were 13 and 15 when I wrote the book. And it is quite strange to see your own adolescence come back around that quickly. Um, I have to say, I, I noted, I was a keen observer of adolescence because it seemed like mine was not that long in the past. Yeah. No, it wasn't. So, so talk a little bit about the math campers. Sure. And, um, and then I'm going to ask you to read from it. Um, quite often you allude to your life in Vermont and it's written so that the reader and poet talk to each other. Yes. The void of silence and mystery. Yeah. <laughs> your poem is focused on your teenage sons and their world living during a global crisis. Yes. So share with us a little bit about it. And if you could read um, a few pages from your book, I would love that for my viewers. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're right. So, Okay, let, let's back up a little bit because um, another thing I do is write a lot of reviews of poetry. And that means that I'm sent hundreds of books a month. I've stopped a little now because I'm working on my Bernie book, but I'm still active. But when I was really at a clip, I would get a hundred books a month or something. And he, I know, and they would just pile up, you know, and, and, but I loved it. And I loved being in the position, you know, to me, a poem is partly constructed by the author and partly constructed by the reader. We have to bring so much of ourselves, you know, to, to a poem. So when I sat down to write the poems in this book, I wanted to represent the process where a poem gets shared between the writer of the verses and the reader who encounters it. So as you noted, and that's really kind of you to observe, the, the structure is a kind of dialogue a sort of dialogue between two figures. One of them is the writer, and one of them is a stranger who's getting the poems in the mail in the form of letters. And she's doing the narrating for most of the book. She's reporting that she has just gotten this stuff. She's quoting from it. She's analyzing it. Anyway, it, it to me, it felt I really wanted to figure out a way to represent how collaborative a, a poem is, you know, how much it's made between people. It's very social, I think. It has the reputation of being a very isolating, isolated art, but you are so dependent on, on readers, you know? So maybe there's a little bit of gratitude in the book for, for readers who, you know, if I, don't, if I don't go to a bookstore and pick up a book of somebody's poems, uh, and nobody does, then they just go away. It's terrible. Even Shakespeare could go away. Even John Milton could go away. And there are risks actually in our culture that they will go away. So it is so dependent on readers. Yeah, yeah. So would you, would you honor us with reading sure. from your beautiful book, The Math Campers? Thank you. Um, well, what I could do is read some sections that have a lot of Burlington in them. Um, yeah, um, this is a, oh, this is sort of funny. This is a, a section where I'm talking about being in high school and driving around with my girlfriend. And uh, it's amazing I had a girlfriend because all I wanted to do was listen to poetry on cassette tapes. Um, 
But, <laughs> but Dan, you needed a muse. I needed a muse. You had to have a muse. You had to have a muse, right? There it is. Okay. Well, anyway, so I had a T.S. Eliot cassette that I used to play, and I used to just just irritate everyone in my car. And so this is about driving on Route 7 uh, down to Middlebury, and we're sort of in, we're, uh, oh, I must say that the, the girlfriend in this one is totally fictionalized. Um, so nobody should be looking for their own biography in this, in this, in this, but, but the setting is real. And it mentions a poem called East Coker by T.S. Eliot. I owned East Coker on cassette. We're close to Middlebury now. I pause and ask my girlfriend how she likes the line, in my beginning is my end. She's deep inside her mind. A memory of her father, this would have been the farm in Charlotte, high bush blueberry under a canopy of red pines. He's picking blueberries for pies. She rolls in a bed of fragrant needles. She's nine or 10. Later, by the lake, they eat leftovers with lemon juice. Houses rise and fall, I pause. Isn't that beautiful? Or extended, or removed? And now she's in the backyard of the house on Pearl, Reggae Fest weekend. This was the summer the stars could physically be touched, palmed, released like butterflies in the electric heat of the city. And well, anyway, there's a lot of recognizable Burlington in that from the 80s, right? Right, Reggae Fest, absolutely. Reggae Fest. Oh my yeah. heavens, that's so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I wanted them to feel universal so you could read these never having been to our city and, and like them, but also I really wanted there to be something, you know, for you and me. Uh, and so here's another such poem. How beautiful it was, how beautiful we were growing up beside the lake with the west right over there, back east where we still were, and in between Juniper Island, where we paddled our kayaks, got high, tied up, and slept. Past campfires, little ash smudge flowers in the sand. Ours is still visible from the pier, the balcony. I swear I was in both places, on the balcony, on the beach. Not as a metaphor, I swear, but split, doubled. That was me, and that was me, with Sean and Mike and Dave and the star cattle and Tom, whose rat-a-tat-tat was shame. Tom's brother, too, his Adonis turbo boost backhand that rent in twain the Mount Mansfield first doubles team, the champions. At least the island wasn't someone's failed attempt to halt time. It had that in common with Pinhead and the Decents and the other bands whose homegrown new wave was television plus the clash minus the re Wednesday reggae lunch on RUV, the dread DJ ripped hits on air. <laughs> um, of course, you know all those references. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely, and having you read it, I just love it. It's, You're the best. Um, and did you play, and did you play tennis for Rice? I did play tennis for Rice. I was on the I was on the doubles team. Yeah, I played. Well, did you Eli remember, tennis? You remember Eli when um, when it was the finals? You were in the championship, and Eli lost his match, and you all lost. And he never, he never got over that. It just still haunts him that he was the yeah. one. <laughs> oh God! Well, it's just driven him to greater, greater sweep, man. I mean, but. No, yeah, you were also on the doubles tennis team with Eli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had a George Shaw as our coach. Remember that guy? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Because they got lost trying to get Eli home and they got lost in Moncton. So we always <laughs> called Eli Moncton. He never called him Eli, he called him Moncton because Eli had him driving around Moncton for like two hours. But anyway. I, well, George was very, uh, George was very resourceful because we didn't have courts, of course, at Rice. So he had to find courts for us to practice. And we would often practice at Bolton Valley, which was a pretty long drive. But one time we actually got on the Charlotte Ferry because he'd found some courts over in New York that we were going to practice at. I mean, it was really it was funny. It was funny. So I, I want to ask you, um, as we're coming to the end of the show, do you miss being in Vermont? Yes, of course. Yeah, I'd love to get back. 
do you, do you think you might? We'd love to have you. Um, come I have a very nice job at Wellesley with great students. Right, and of course, your, your career is there. So absolutely. <laughs> but do you come back? I mean, do you have a place up here? Do you get to come back and visit? Is your, is your mother still here? Yeah, my mom is uh, in South Burlington, so I see her a bunch. Yeah, we come back. Uh, my whole family loves Burlington. Maybe one of my kids will go to UVM. I don't know. Um, yeah. We're there a lot. We're there a lot in Burlington. And also, sometimes we got to Greensboro for, for a more rustic uh, vacation. Right. But uh, yeah. So I want to move into your current project about Bernie, this bio yeah. biography that you're that you're tackling on the life of Bernie Sanders. Can you talk to us like, I mean, absolutely. I mean, why wouldn't anyone want to know the life of Bernie Sanders? There's no one like him and there's no, been no one like him since in That's Burlington. Story. And so isn't it interesting that, that I don't think anyone's ever really tackled Bernie in this way and to have someone like you to do this uh, is just so super special and it yeah. will be so super special for him. But talk to us a little bit about what came into your mind because when Bernie was in office, you were, you were like ten or twelve, right? You know, I was born in seventy. When he came in, I was when he came in, I was nine. So, and I guess he was seventeen. I was seventeen when he left. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, honestly, Melinda, I just felt like I had a great story to tell. And um, you know, these days we're all supposed to just write about our lived experience, right? So here was my lived experience as a teenager growing up and really broadened my world. The city really changed, you know, it really, oh my God. I mean, how lucky were we? You were really have, lucky. Have Bernie, and were you, do you remember the moment where the bird landed on the podium? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, he's a magical creature. He really is. I, know. He's just, I he's love common. it. So and the other thing I would say is coming out of the pandemic, you know, I wanted a project that was, um, that involved talking and listening to people um, you know, poetry can be kind of isolating. So, you know, you, for example, I'm going to be interviewing you and Rick next week and lots of people like you who made a big difference in the city. Well, I wouldn't have met you. I mean, I knew of you, but I would not have met you if I, right. if you hadn't reached out to me. So I'm just, I'm so delighted. Oh, um, thank you. I'm going to be able to participate in some form or fashion with you understanding this man. Yeah. Um, and anybody who's watching this who has any information would like to get in touch with me, uh, I'm very easy to find. Very, very easy to find. <laughs> so Maybe too I, easy. so I I um so and Bernie, does Bernie know that you're writing this book about him or that you're embarking on this? Have you reached out to him? I've reached out to his people. I don't want to be a pest, uh, but his brother Larry's helping me. Um so I would imagine that they've been in touch and good old friends, close friends like Jim Rader and other famous names from the city. So a lot of people are on board, but I have a plan either way. I do. He's a busy man. Right. But so are you. I mean, yeah. and to have somebody like you, Dan Chazen, to write this book for him is got to be a gift for Bernie. I, I mean, that's so. all I have to say. I mean, he is Thank so you. lucky to have you be that person. Thank you. Um, it really will be written. You know, I want to write good sentences, good paragraphs. I want it to be, an, you know. A, well, I, think, I think, and I think you owe him a poem. Yeah, well, I may do that. <laughs> there, needs, there needs to be a Bernie poem. Why not? I may um, do that. So I want to ask you about the state of our world. Uh, we know now that Roe v. Wade's going to be overturned. We have, a, we have a planet that's burning. We have young people who have just experienced uh, two plus years of COVID. Yeah. Um, what is your vision for the world? Well, currently, because of the news about Roe, I'm just so pessimistic. I just feel terrible. I, I'm not going to give up hope, but, you know, it was good to be with my students yesterday. I teach at an all-women's college, and uh, it was good to be with them yesterday and just to go through the issues. I had an 8.30 class, and I had read, and some of my students had read the draft decision and just the appalling rhetoric. This guy, Alito, is a psychotic lunatic. So... Um, I don't know. I, 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 I feel, I'm afraid I feel very pessimistic, but maybe, my, maybe writing the Bernie book is a way of recovering some optimism because there's a, there's a light in the darkness there. Well, you know, I'm a product of the sixties and you know what our generation did and what we didn't do. We certainly could have done a lot more, but I'm hoping that young people rise up in the way that we did. And only 17% of my generation changed the world. And we have 70% of this country on board with That's great. more progressive beliefs. So I have great hope, but I, yeah. I, I, I wanted to reach out to you because 
Yeah. You have a depth in, you have a depth where you go. And, um, and I, and I also know that politically we're moving into sort of a very tenuous place in our yes. government that could be, so you're going to have, really, to be, you have to be an inspiration for us, Dan. Well, I'll try. I, I am inspired by the, you know, I have two teenage sons and lots of students around that age too. And, uh, they're not gonna they're not gonna slack on this, you know. I think the future is theirs. They know it. I mean, it's life or death for them, right? It is, and that's that's a that's a that's a tough place for us to be as we look at our children and our grandchildren. Um, so this is a conversation for another day, which I hope when you finish your book on Bernie that you will come back and and and, and, that, and that you will meet with me and that we can chat mm -hmm. again. And I know I'm gonna see you in a little bit to yep. talk about your book about Bernie, but um, I just want to thank you, uh, Dan Chason, for being, for being with me today and for talking to my viewers. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining us. This has been a really special interview uh, with Dan, and I will see you all shortly, and I wish you well in the springtime. Uh, take care and be well. And Dan, thank you for being with me. Thank you, Melinda. It was a pleasure. It was really a pleasure. Really a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.